my name is Chris Kennedy, and I am the Assistant Director at the Urban Systems Lab at the New School University in New York. So excited to be here with my colleague, Pablo Jerez Cantis, who will be helping to moderate today's session. Before we kick things off, we just want to give a little bit of framing for the agenda and talk a little bit about who's going to be joining us here today. So we want to move to the next slide. Great. Thanks, Pablo. So tonight's event brings together researchers and practitioners in New York City to discuss the challenges and opportunities of novel data sources, processing, and data visualization to advance urban climate resilience in New York City. We're going to talk a little bit about flooding, but also different kinds of data sets, um, especially how we're leveraging the open data that the New York City office, the Bears office provides. We're fortunate today to be joined by Katie Graziano, a New York Sea Grant Coastal Resiliency Extension Specialist, who is based at the Science and Resilience Institute at Jamaica Bay. Andrea Silverman, who is an assistant professor in environmental engineering at the NYU Tandon School, and also co-director of FloodNet. And also Madalena Romano, director of the Data Asset Management Unit at New York City Department of, Trans Department of Transportation, as well as Annie Carfuro, a climate justice organizer at WEACT. Welcome to our speakers. I'm so excited to have you all here. So for our agenda tonight, if you want to move to the next slide, Pablo, we're going to kick things off with a brief introduction from Pablo, who will be talking a little bit about his work at the Urban Systems Lab and talk a little bit about how this event came together. Then hear from each of our panelists and conclude with some time for questions and answers towards the end. As Carrie said, with the event will be recorded, so we'll make sure to set up a link ahead after the event commences. And we highly encourage you to use the chat function in the Zoom to pose any questions or comments along the way. I'm going to try to do my best to keep track of that so we have a sense of that at the end. All right. And before we kick things off, an alternative to publish shortly, I just want to introduce the Urban Systems Lab and give you a little bit of context for where we're coming from. And then we'll proceed to our lovely panelists. So the Urban System Lab was founded in 2015 uh, by Dr. Tyman McPherson, who serves as the lab's director and is also a professor of urban ecology here at the New School. The lab is an interdisciplinary research design and practice space, and we aim to provide new insight in developing more equitable, resilient, and sustainable cities. We do this by bringing together designers, research scientists, ecologists, policymakers, and others to really think about how we can enhance decision-making and science communication from local to global scales. So this means we regularly are working with the city of New York, especially the mayor's office of climate resilience to really think about how to address some of the emerging challenges faced by climate and other different kinds of social and environmental challenges. So as Pablo will tell you, we've been involved in a lot of different kinds of storm water and flooding related work here at the city. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how the lab sort of advances different kinds of cutting edge approaches to modeling and also data visualization. So welcome again, and I'm going to hand it over to Pablo, and then we'll hear next from Katie. All right, Chris, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. And before I move on, I just want to restate that I am really, really, really excited to be here and super thankful that we've been given this opportunity to present it's not, more, it's not only our work, but also our experiments and our games, because we're lucky to have a position in which we're able to ask questions into the air and then see what comes out. And because of that, I think it's very important that we, we put some context into why we are here today, because in many ways, we're here today because of a series of emails, a series of conversations the day after Ida that just got us thinking how what can we do about this what what can we're so used to working in a certain manner but we see all of these you can call it resources out there and it might allow us to think differently about things that we've been chewing on for many years so yeah the way that we got here is from the feeling that during spring and summer in 2021 the way that new york city's practitioners and researchers advocacy organizations and even just people think about flood risk and flood risk management might have reached a turning point. We begin in May 21 when the city's major office of resiliency releases the New York City Stormwater Resiliency Plan, which is 
the first ever comprehensive plan in the city that tackles straight at pluvial stormwater management and flood risk. It is a result of a, of a heroic effort between city agencies and academic partners, handling vast amounts of data and different intricacies of what flood risk and stormwater management really it needs to, to have in order to be achieved properly, but also filling humongous data gaps through years long, years long exercises of modeling and gathering data and understanding how the city's sewers really work and where they are located and what are their dimensions. Thanks to that project, to that stormwater resiliency plan, the city now counts for the first time with citywide pluvial flood risk maps that are not only, that's not only already a, enough of an advancement, but both during phase one and phase two of the stormwater resiliency plan, more than one single scenario was considered in order to map flood risk. And that is very important because when we talk about flood risk, it's very important to, like with many other extreme weather events, we need to acknowledge that there is variability and that it's different to think about a storm that it happens once every 10 years and once that might happen once every 100 years. So this is how the maps look and this is how the data is presented um, and how it has been made available, which is another great thing about the Stormwater Resiliency Plan and the New York City Open Data Infrastructure, which is that this data was very shortly after the plan was released, was already publicly available at New York City's Open Data website. And you can see how data is presented, and this is important for the future conversations we're going to have. Two separate categories of flooding, which are flooding being deeper than four inches and deeper than one foot. You can think about this thinking that four inches means that you might be unable to walk it safely, and one foot, you might be unable to drive through it safely. As I said, this data is available in both for both scenarios. And we're looking forward to different research avenues and collaborations with the city that more than these two scenarios will eventually become available for us researchers and data nerds to use, but also advocacy organizations, decision makers, and any other data nerds who might be you know, able in investigating this to have access to it, question it, raise questions, and make their own conclusions about it. Thanks to this data being already available, we have even, in, in, a, in an attempt to provide our little grain of salt, of sand, sorry, this is a Spanish expression, we have developed at the Urban Systems Lab data visualization platform that presents these layers available, provided by the open data platform, depicting flood risk according to each of the scenarios, but also enabling users to activate and deactivate other layers, such as social vulnerability, the location of different bus stops or metro subway stops but to again enrich the conversation about what is flood risk what is risk against what and what is exposure from whom at the same time that we are talking in new york city about this new flood resilience stormwater resiliency plan here at the usl we were dealing with in several cities some other flood risk mapping projects one of them was in yonkers we're doing our own modeling, which is not the same modeling as the one in the city. Our own modeling, of course, limited in resources and scope, was facing severe criticism and skepticism from local polit politicians and practitioners within their entire right, questioning our results. There was a particular location in the city of Yonkers that our model was identifying as potentially floodable and with severe consequences. And this is the kind of response that we got. This area has never flooded before. Has the city engineer seen this and validated your modeling approach? I don't believe that this study is valid. And then Elsa happened, which not only flooded some subways in New York City, but also up there in Yonkers. That precise location that had been source of questioning did flood. And we know that because the very next day after the Elsa storm, Rampage through New York City metropolitan area, there was a video on YouTube showing that exact junction flooding in Yonkers. The people that I collaborate with were very ecstatic, saying, damn, you're a prophet. That's something that somebody did say. We're going to have this person in their words. 
we should project it onto their home so that like he thinks about it twice next time that he wants to question your methods. But you might, you might already be thinking, but Pablo, why are you not showing us that video right now? Why are you not telling us about that location? For us to think about later on, this video is, it just doesn't exist anymore because the owner has decided to put it down from YouTube. So you might think that I'm making this up, but you, you, you will have to take my word. That location did flood and my ego for sure was boosted. But more importantly, I think that it brings a very important point that that just doesn't exist anymore. And we have been unable to locate it. After Elsa, summer went on. Just 10 single days, two extreme weather events hit New York City again, Henry and Ida. And in, in those storms that were, again, 10 days apart from each other, the, one, the record for, a, for the amount of rain falling within one hour was broken twice. First in Henry with 1.96 inches, and then in Ida with more than three inches. Those of us who live in New York City and are aware of this, we know that Ida, not only in New Orleans and other parts of the States, but also in New York City brought catastrophic consequences, causing even the loss of life of several people. And while I was at home looking at the rain from my window, I was also watching the storm and unveil through Twitter. And hundreds and hundreds of people were tweeting and retweeting and commenting on real time footage that was being shared about with the same streets that we've all go, gone through to do our business and our leisure, actually having cars floating, rivers and lakes like these ones. And again, as I say, this was happening in real time with even updates being provided on the same locations through time during the Ida storm. And the day after, days after, some of us, these researchers and data nerds, were excited that Twitter had suddenly flourished with so much data and footage. And we were excited, given our experiences in places like Yonkers, to ask this question in New York City. Can we explore if Twitter data and Twitter footage could be used to validate the flood risk maps that the city has just released in May? To do this, all we had to do was identify tweets showing flooding, and then if the address was not provided, geolocating that footage by doing some detective work, combining Google Street View with our knowledge of the, of the city to place each tweet showing flooding as a point in a map. And that way we were able to compare the location of the tweet or the location that the tweet was showing with the flood risk maps that I showed, showed before that only identify flood risk as a either four inches or one foot flooding extent. And doing that, we were able to, in a limited amount of time, georeference or geolocate 18 tweets across the city, of which 100% either directly overlap with the flood risk maps released by the city for the extreme scenario, or are located within a 30 to 60 feet uh, distance. We can talk about that 30 to 60 feet distance later if there's people are curious, but what I can anticipate is just that most of the tweets that were not located close to the flooding were just located in places that the flood models had not modeled, such as very big parks or highways. But there's something that was like that caught my attention even more, which was that throughout the process of watching several hours of videos and photos showing flooding and showing uh, cars floating and even the liverista walking through the through more than two feet of water to deliver Chinese food. I was feeling disgusted. I was having a physical reaction. And I realized that even though I've spent most of my career as a researcher focused on climate change, looking at this map here that just shows the extent of flooding in a very categorical way, there is a different way of expressing flooding and climate change that I had very rarely come in touch with so closely, such as this photo that we see here that is referred to the number two in the map. And we, it was like a, a realization that we were looking at things a bit wrong and that we could even be more humble because in our selfish interest of validating the model, we were missing on the fact that we were witnessing the, ex the direct experience of New York City's communities of how it looks to experience a, an extreme weather event of this magnitude. 
these thoughts were released in, in a text that my colleague Jiray and I released in our lab's journal or magazine. It's called Resiliency Quarterly, and the title of the article is Beyond Flood Risk Mapping, and we will be happy to share it in the, in the chat later on as a link if, in, in case anybody wants to read about this. Again, showing those tweets in, the, in, the, in, in our paper brought us again to the same question. Do we place these tweets in our text without telling anyone? Do we have the right to do that? In the end, we decided to play it safe and humble and, com and contacted the authors of the tweets that we had identified to ask them for explicit permission to post this, uh, their material in our text, in our essay. This is the people that agreed, and we, I'm very thankful with, to them, and I hope that we can actually keep talking and chatting about how they experienced flooding in the moment that they were taking those videos. And this brings us to the reason why we ended up contacting the amazing panelists that we have today, with whom we are very eager to hear how from their professional, and if you're interested or you're, if you're willing, personal standpoint, how do you think that we can do to improve the process through which we gather, we share, we visualize and communicate data that shows flood risk? as well as capturing not only the risk itself, but also the experiences that people are going through. And how can this type of data support climate change adaptation or a fair climate change adaptation in cities like New York City? With that, I'm bringing in, I'm switching to, to Katie. I'm giving you the floor. I'm gonna stop sharing so you can. And I am really looking forward to hearing your thoughts about this. All right. Thank you so much, Pablo. And what you just said resonated a lot with what I want to talk about. Yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation to present today. My name is Katie Graziano. I am a Coastal Resilience Extension Specialist with New York Sea Grant. And my position is based at the Science and Resilience Institute at Jamaica Bay. And together with the Institute, we coordinate a project called the Community Flood Watch Project, which we call Flood Watch for short. And that's what I'll be mostly presenting about today. And before I get into it, I just want to acknowledge that Flood Watch is a highly collaborative project and all of the progress that we've made in the last couple of years is thanks to all of these partnerships, the funders, and I especially want to bring attention to that first row of our community partners who are really the core of Flood Watch. So what is Flood Watch? It is a community-based flood reporting project. It started around 2018 when we noticed that, similar to Pablo was experiencing or seeing, that People were using Facebook, especially in these like low lying coastal neighborhoods around Jamaica Bay, where they were experiencing tidal, chronic tidal flooding associated with unusual, unusually high tides. People living in those neighborhoods were using Facebook to share photos of the flooding and to communicate about the flooding. And there was a lot of really valuable data in those social media posts that wasn't really getting captured in a way that was standardized or shareable. And so Flood Watch was a response to that to try to create a platform where we could collect all this data and make it standardized and shareable. And so in late 2019, we create we launched a Survey123 form, which is it's an ArcGIS survey platform, and we, we launched it to collect flood reports. And since then, we've collected almost 700 reports, and each of those contain a photo of the flood, the date, the time, the location and then some details to provide a little bit more context about that flood event. And in this, you can see in this map of New York City, these are our clustered flood reports that we've gotten so far. Most of them, I'm not sure if you can see my the cursor. Okay, so most of the flood reports, as you can see, are, are clustered around Jamaica Bay. So this is like Broad Channel and Hamilton Beach and Howard Beach. These are where they're experiencing a lot of tidal flooding and capturing that through Flood Watch. But in the last year and a half or so, we actually expanded into Coney Island over here and into the Bronx, specifically City Island up here. And in those places, we're starting to see more and more reports that are coming in that are associated either purely with rainfall or with a combination of rainfall and high tide. And I just say that to, to bring attention to the fact that we started with tidal flooding and documenting high tides, but... As we're expanding, we're realizing the value of collecting information from all across New York City from all different types of, of flood events. And before I get this, is, I'm a little bit focused on the data sharing and the data collection, but I just wanna emphasize that Flood Watch 
is a whole program built around the data, but the data is not the whole program. It's really a lot about the relationships that we're building between residents and government and scientists. And all of our partners in each of these categories contribute something to Floodwatch and also hopefully gain something out of being part of this kind of like knowledge and information sharing network. And with that in mind, with this kind of hope of, we, we wanna make sure that the data that are collected are useful to our users. In this past year, in 2021, we hosted a series of, workshop, of workshops with that theme of like, how can we make this, these data useful for you? And in those conversations, a lot of what came up really highlighted the challenges that exist with Floodwatch. And so the things that we heard are, it, it feels like the reports go into a black box, you submit it in the survey one, two, three form, and then what? It's difficult to understand the data, it's difficult to access it. There was, there's a need to be able to like easily share the flood reports with external parties, people who don't really know what's happening on the ground. A lot of residents, I think, were experiencing reporting fatigue which I, which is very understandable. You don't want to, you, no one wants to take the same exact photo of flooding in the same exact place over and over again uh, without really seeing anything happening with that information. And then lastly, one issue is that the data were not, are not necessarily rich or accurate enough for some kinds of decision-making. And so today, some of the, the, the products and advancements that we've made in the last year, I think, speak to a lot of these challenges. And that's why I'm bringing this up, because uh, uh, a lot of the, the products, yeah, speak to the challenges that we heard about from our community stakeholders and our other stakeholders. And so the first of those is that we put a lot of work into data visualization to help this issue of feeling like it's not very engaging. The reports are just going into a black box. And this was, this was done in partnership. At, with funding from FEMA through a cooperating technical partners program with the mayor's office of climate resiliency. And in that project, we contracted with Pratt, their spatial analysis and um, vis visualization initiative to come up with these data products. And in the process had more workshops with community members to make sure we were creating a, a data portal that worked for the people who were hopefully going to use it. The first product that we came up with is just a, it was a wireframe of a web interface. It places the flood reports in the context of other important, other flood information that could be useful to someone who's looking at it. And this, I hope, really would solve the issue of feeling like your report just goes into a black box because this is a place where, as a flood watch reporter, you could go and see where it falls in the context of other flood information, and it communicates that more readily. And then the second product that we came up with is a more static flood report. So this is something that you could, for a certain neighborhood or for, for a certain district, you could print out this snapshot in time, this is your flood report for your neighborhood. And this would hopefully address the issue of feeling like it's the data is not very understandable and, and there needs to be a way to communicate it with external people someone who's not living in the neighborhood, working in the neighborhood, doesn't necessarily know the issues on the ground or how it's impacting a neighborhood. This is the kind of thing you could print it out and hand it off to an elected official or an agency or something like that. And so both of those were prototypes, but we are continuing this work and hopefully we'll have more to share in the next year. And then in the meantime, while we're coming up with these more kind of the more sophisticated data share, in the meantime, I still needed a way to share what we have so far with any interested users. And so I created this ArcGIS data dashboard. And after I'm finished presenting, I can share a link to this. And it's so anyone can go in and look at all the reports that have been submitted since 2018. And if you have an ArcGIS account, you can download a CSV file through this data dashboard. I will say that I basically taught myself how to do data dashboards while I was making this. So there's plenty of room for improvement. And if there's anyone on this call who has some expertise and is willing to give some feedback and some advice, I am very open to that. And then I just want to conclude speaking really briefly about the flood sensors and Dr. Silverman will be speaking more about it later on in the panel. So I'm not going to take up too much time about the background of flood sensors and everything, but I just wanted to say how valuable the flood sensor data has been and, and I think will be in supplementing the community flood watch information. And I'll, yeah, I'll, I'm not going to give any background. So I'll just say that the benefits that I've already noticed so far are that 
on the flood watch side, we've been building these relationships for a long time. We, we have these strong relationships with different neighborhoods who are experiencing flooding. And through those, that kind of paved the way to the flood, to, to the engagement process of, the, of installing the flood sensors and testing them out and seeing how they actually work on the ground. So that was really valuable. Through that network, we have this like really strong, a lot of local knowledge exists in our network. And that helps when we're thinking about sensor placement, like where can we put a sensor that would be most valuable to a community or to a resident? And then, so we have those connections to make those kinds of calls. This speaks to what Pablo was, this next one speaks to what Pablo was discussing. The photos really provide visual context. And that makes a huge difference, I think, when you're trying to tell a story or just really show what's happening on the ground. If you have a photo next to a sensor reading, I think that's way more valuable than just having that sensor reading. And then lastly, I, I certainly see a lot of benefit to actively engaging residents and collecting flood photos in a way that I think like the passive sensor data collection doesn't necessarily achieve. And so I appreciate that through Floodwatch, we can still make sure we're connecting with residents and taking, making sure we're valuing the local knowledge that's coming through their contributions to the flood data. And then on the flood sensor side, they provide accurate, precise, and rich data in a way that Floodwatch just can't because Floodwatch is a great snapshot in time, but, it, but if you put a flood sensor on that same street corner, you will have 24 seven information about how long the flood lasted, exactly how deep was the flood. So it really fills in a lot of gaps and at the same time addresses the issue I mentioned of reporting fatigue. And then lastly, there's, there's the potential for the sensor network to build more like equity, to make flood data collection more equitable in the sense that if you don't know about flood watch, if you don't have time to participate in flood watch, that shouldn't exclude you from having high quality data about flooding in your neighborhood and for being elevated to the platforms that we're creating. And so that is my spiel about Flood Watch. And I'm very excited to hear the other panelists. And if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to contact me with this information here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for your presentation. And mm -hmm. it's such an amazing project. I think that our next uh, presenter is going to be Andrea Silverman. Is already sharing the screen, so now we're ready. Great. Yeah. First of all, hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, Katie and Pablo set me up really well here. I'm Andrea Silverman. I'm one of the leads on the FloodNet project, and I'm here representing the project. But I do want to point out that this is a collaboration between researchers at New York University, at CUNY, the Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency and the Science Resilience Institute at Jamaica Bay. And we work a lot with Flood Watch and KD as part of that partnership as well. And so what I'm gonna be presenting is our work on FloodNet, which are the flood sensors that KD was alluding to in the last presentation. And before I start, in terms of personal experience, the reason why I ended up coming to sort of this flood data world was because as a researcher, I typically focus on water quality. And me and my collaborators at NYU were interested in flood water contaminants. And we realized in part of this work, when we went to, we wanted to sample floodwaters, we actually did not know when to go to sample. We didn't know, you know, exactly what kind of rainstorm produced flooding in different locations that were, we were working in. And so we started looking around to see if there was flood data available for us to work with, to, to say this location floods a lot or this rainstorm, this intensity leads to a flood in a certain location. The data sets that we found were, first of all, the New York City 311 service requests related to floods. So this is data that's on um, New York City open data. And we also found community flood watch project data. And both of these data sets are super rich. They're really important, valuable, high quality data sets. But as Katie mentioned, there's a couple of challenges with them in fulfilling some of the, the needs of some stakeholders related to flood, flood data. First of all, for us who wanted to respond in real time to a flood, this data tends to not be real time data, at least not the 311 flood requests. They tend to be uploaded at a later date. Sometimes there's challenges with geo stamps. And I know that Pablo also mentioned that with social media data, you don't always know exactly the location where that, that data was collected. Another challenge, as Katie alluded to, is that you need a witness. So for you to have community reported data, there has to be a witness. And that witness then needs to know 
that there's a place to report to and how to do that reporting. And even when you do have these witnesses, there could be reporting fatigue after a while. And then additionally, with this qualitative data, there is a lot of richness. And I'm, as I present the flood sensors and their data, I definitely don't negate the importance of combining quantitative data with qualitative data. One of the challenges with this qualitative data is that we don't necessarily have quantitative data on flood onset, duration, depth, and profile. And so with all that in mind, we started um, asking, can we design a sensor to monitor urban street level flooding and then be able to do so in a way that provides data to various stakeholders in ways that are meaningful and useful for them. And as we were starting to develop this project at NYU, we were put in touch with the mayor's offices and Flood Watch. And we ended up partnering with all of them to form what we called the FloodNet Consortium. And I'll tell you in a second who's in the consortium, but first of all, our overall goal was to develop a flood water level sensor network to monitor hyperlocal street level flooding across New York City. And even though I'll be talking about the New York City context, these sensors can be used anywhere. And they're really agnostic of what type of flooding you're looking at and what location you're in. And so two goals um, or subtasks are one, to design, build, and deploy these low cost, robust sensors. And then two, to develop an interface to meaningfully contextualize and communicate the data to a range of stakeholders. Oh, sorry, we skipped ahead. Okay, so the consortia, it's, as I mentioned, NYU, CUNY, Science Resilience Institute of Jamaica Bay, and Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency. And I do want to point out that the partnerships that we have with community groups are incredibly important. So every time we go into a new neighborhood to deploy flood sensors, we are in communication with community-based organizations in that neighborhood. And so we have a number of organizations we've worked with that were so grateful to have the, the support and partnership that we've had with them. And it, it expands as we expand to new neighborhoods in New York City. This is our sensor in a nutshell. So when designing a, um, a hyper-local um, sensor network, it has to be pretty widely distributed. There's a lot of locations across New York City that might eventually flood. And so we want to be able to make sure that these are low cost so that we can build a lot of them. And they have to be independent of power infrastructure and data transmission infrastructure because we don't want to have to plug them in. And so these sensors are built based on ultrasonic sensor technology. So this sensor will send a ultrasonic beam down to the surface below it. That beam will bounce back and we'll be able to measure the distance based on the amount of time it takes to receive that, uh, that signal. I'll show you what the data looks like in a second, but I do just wanna also point out that they are, all have a battery inside and they're charged by solar panels. And we've been deploying these sensors on these drive rails that are essentially whenever you see a street sign, like in a parking sign or a stop sign or whatnot, they're on these drive rails and we received permission from the Department of Transportation in New York City to utilize these rails for, for deploying our flood sensors. To tell you something, show you how we manage the data, as I mentioned, we're ultimately, or originally the raw data is distance data because we're trying to figure out what the distance is between the sensors and the plane below it. And so when there's no flood on a straight line and when a flood happens, we actually have less decreased distance. And so we have a data analysis pipeline that cleans up this data and flips it around so that we can convert to actual flood depth. We know this is zero, this is the ground, and this is a flood. And I'll actually show you this flood in more detail in a couple of minutes. To make our sensors be able to be independent, we need them to operate at a low power requirements. And we also, so do that to actually get the data. All of our sensors will transmit their data to what we call a gateway. A gateway is actually plugged in and connected to the internet. And if we have one gateway, so this is our gateway in Gowanus, a gateway can talk to sensors deployed within a mile radius. And so we can deploy as many sensors as we need to within this radius, and they'll all talk to that one gateway. So give you a sense of what the sensors look like. These are our generation one sensors. Our first sensors were installed in Gowanus and in Hamilton Beach in Queens. And you can see the solar panel and the ultrasonic sensor here. And this is one of those sensors um, installed on the signpost. And this sensor is going to be measuring floodwaters right below the sensor. So that's one thing to note is these sensors measure the sidewalk just at a 90 degree angle to where the sensor is deployed. This is one of our most recent sensors. This is our current iteration of the design. Uh, these sensors, the sensor in particular is in Red Hook. Um, and with every sensor, we put up signage to let people walking by in the neighborhood know what it is, because 
you don't know what it is, you might think it's a camera. And so we're very clear this is a flood sensor. We provide information on the project where they can find more information, who to contact. And we also make it very clear that we're not connect, uh, collecting any identifying information. One of the core principles of our project is that everything is open. So we're still working on our data portal, but all the, the data will be open and available to everyone. And all of the sensor design plans, software, et cetera, design manuals, QC requirements is all open source and available on our GitHub site. And we're always interested to get feedback on how approachable this information is. So if you're interested in building your own sensor, the plans are there and we're always curious to know how it went. We currently have 28 sensors deployed in around New York. We don't have any sensors yet in Staten Island, but that's supposed to happen in the next month or two. But we do have sensors in Manhattan, the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn at these locations. One thing to note is that in the next five years, we're planning to expand the network to hundreds of sensors. And so while we are focusing on a couple of regions right now, we do have um, pretty big expansion plans. And what I want to do is to show you what the data look like. I want to pick two case studies in two locations. And so the first is looking um, at Gowanus. And again, these are the first sensors that we deployed. And this map down here is that flood map at stormwater.nyc that was that big modeling effort that the city put on to predict where floods may occur. And one thing you can see is that a lot of our sensor locations like this at Carroll and Forth are places where we do see flood risk. In Red Hook, there's a couple corridors in which we installed our sensors. So we definitely use these maps to figure out where to deploy. We also talk to community members to find out where does it flood often and where are important places where, where floodwaters impact you. Okay, so to show this data, I want to show you an example from Hurricane Henri. And I don't have to go into the details because uh, Pablo thankfully set me up here. But this is the data from three sensors in Gowanus during Tropical Storm Henri. And there's a couple of things I want to point out. First is rainfall data is in this lighter blue. Our flood sensor data is in this darker blue. First thing to note is that we have these three sensors in in Guanas, and in each location, there's a very different flood profile. And this, I think, really nicely illustrates that different locations behave differently. And that if you wanna have a sense of the flooding that's going on, you have to look at a hyperlocal level. Just because you look at one intersection doesn't mean that's what happens at another intersection in the city. Second of all, the value of having this flood profile information can be seen, first of all, in the fact that in these in this neighborhood, we didn't have just one flood during that night, we actually had two. And there were two cloud bursts that occurred. And at each of those cloud bursts, we had uh, you know, flood waters rose and then they receded and went away and then rose again. And if we were relying on data from witnesses or points in time from social media data, we may not have known that there were two distinct floods here. And this type of data is really important for some of our stakeholder classes like the DEP's Bureau of Water and Sewer Operations because they're trying to build models or they have models that, that relate to drainage. And so they're able to actually look at these figures and say, okay, did our drainage model perform the way we thought it did, or do we need to iterate for a particular location? One other thing about flood profile here at Carroll and Forth, floodwaters um, increased very rapidly. So we had a flood that went up to 28 inches within about 15 or 20 minutes. And that's a rapid rise in water that creates really hazardous conditions. One other feature I want to point out is that we have a flood alert system. So this line here is um, a three inch flood. And when floodwaters reach three inches, we send out alerts to those that sign up for those alerts. And that includes city agencies. And so for example, we have a couple beta users in New York City Emergency Management who have signed up for these flood alerts. And the community members can also sign up for the alerts and get alerted as these floodwaters are rising. For my second case study, um, we'll look at Hamilton Beach, Queens, which is one of the neighborhoods that Flood Watch has been operating in for a while. And Hamilton Beach is at risk for tidal flooding. And when there are high tides, we have higher high tides, often at the full moon and the new moon, this neighborhood often. And so this is data from a king tide that occurred in October 2021 in Hamilton Beach at two different sensor locations. And what we have here is the tide data. And then what we could see is that the higher of the two tides each day for the four days in which that king tide occurred, we had flooding that occurred in, 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 in some parts of Hamilton Beach. Another thing to point out is there's a small tail here and there's a challenge, like one of the drains is not working super well in this neighborhood. And when we were out there, you know, witnessing a flood one day, one of the residents came and said to us, 
this always happens. There's always, the floodwaters will come down with the tide, but there'll always be something remaining for a couple, up to 12 hours. And so we're actually able to see that in the flood profile. We have a website, uh, floodnet.nyc. We are still working on building our data dashboard. We're hoping that it'll be available in mid-April. And so once it's up, all of this flood data is going to come up in real time from all of our sensors, and we'll have public access through this portal. And we'll make sure that we, we let people know broadly once it's available. And before I leave you, I just want to, we've been talking a lot to different stakeholders, city agencies, community members, and researchers about some of their flooded needs. And there's a lot of flood data uses that have come up, some of which Katie and Pablo talked about. So community members being able to advocate for, for their communities when they were, there's a lot of flooding, day-to-day decision-making around surrounding living with water when people are in, in flood prone locations, resiliency and transportation planning by both city agencies and individuals. So how do you navigate around floodwaters or if there's locations that flood a lot, how can we then put in interventions? There's been interest, as Katie mentioned, in validating some evidence of flood extent. So pairing this quantitative data with community reports, more systematically and more localized activation of emergency response centers, and also post-storm recovery. We've actually had the Red Cross reach out to us after Ida to say, do you have flood data? We're trying to understand what parts of the city were, were, were harder hit, because when there's a citywide emergency, it is hard for city agencies and other response teams to know exactly where to go. We also know, we've also talked a lot about as a community about how we're expecting flood floods to happen more frequently into the future, but we don't have a, a baseline data set so that we can monitor those the, the change in flood frequency over time. So there's an opportunity here. And additionally, the, the models that are predicting flood locations at flood risk with different stormwater scenarios there's, it's very hard to validate them. And so one thing that we're doing is we're partnering with the city to try to validate the flood prediction model so that when they iterate them, we're able to say, okay, yes, this prediction worked. It was a little off. This type of storm led to this type of flood or this extent of flooding. With that, I'm going to stop. I'm looking forward to the discussion in a couple of minutes and into the remainder of the, the presentations. Thank you, Andrea. It's again, I have so many questions, but I'm going to keep them to myself yeah. for now. And we're going to move on to the next presenter, who is Annie Carforo from We Act, who we are super happy to have with us, giving probably a, a more on the ground based experience or interest. Do you have permi- sharing permissions, Annie? I do, yes. Great, then. Whenever Thank you're ready. you. Hi, everyone. Happy uh, Tuesday forgot what day it was for a minute. I am, yeah, thank you so much, Pablo. Thank you, Urban Systems Labs, for inviting me to speak. My name is Annie Carforo, and I am the Climate Justice Organizer. We act for environmental justice. And I'm here today to talk to you guys about our Climate Ready Uptown Plan that we're actually working um, in collaboration with with Urban Systems Labs, which is a community-led project that is aiming to improve residents of Northern Manhattan's ability to understand and interact with flood vulnerability data. And we've seen a re- really renewed sense of urgency around this after this um, past summer and the flooding experiences that Northern Manhattan residents faced. And but yeah, I'm happy to talk to you about what we're doing on the ground, organizing in the communities of East, Central, West Harlem, Washington Heights, and Inwood. Uh, so really quick, just a little bit about We Act, in case you don't know who we are. We're an environmental justice community-based nonprofit working towards environmental justice in West Harlem and the rest of Northern Manhattan. And we empower and organize low-income residents and people of color to build healthy communities for all by participating in the creation of sound and fair environmental health policies and practices. So we've been a local environmental justice organization. We do state and national advocacy And we have over 30 years of experience advocating for environmental justice policy change and on the ground, real quality of life changes for Northern Manhattan. As I had mentioned earlier, emergency preparedness around climate change has been a priority for our membership of over 1,000 Northern Manhattan residents for uh, quite a while. It was one of the main topics of conversation when we did community visioning in 2015, but it really resurfaced in a more urgent way after the summer of 2021 when. There was, and specifically around flooding. And that's because between Tropical Storm Elsa and Hurricane Ida, Northern Manhattan really experienced an alarming and frightening amount of flash flooding or sudden flooding of really popular areas. And I think people really suddenly felt very unprepared for what was happening. And I think this video can just 
slowly play in the background while I talk. Um, and so this got WEAC thinking, we know that the data exists that warns us about this, these areas that flood. And the data is actually pretty accurate. Uh, looking at the stormwater NYC map that Urban Systems Labs put out, these different um, cross streets all are um, noted on the map as areas that flood. But there's a disconnect between the data that the city's putting out there and out there for our consumption and our community. And so we really wanted to understand how to get this data into the hands of people who are on the ground so that they can understand how it's impacting them on an individual level and they can really create an individual and or family plan for themselves. So that leads me to our, there we go, our climate ready uptown plan, which is what we're going to be working on with urban systems labs and is still very much in the work. But we wanted to really first understand the landscape of emergency preparedness in northern Manhattan. And so we tapped into existing local resources that have been doing this type of organizing on the ground for years. And specifically, we worked with East Harlem Coad, which was a group that formed after Hurricane Sandy when they felt that East Harlem wasn't getting really the community-wide the disaster response that it needed. And it was really falling behind in the recovery efforts after Hurricane Sandy. And so they engage in community-wide disaster planning and strategy and help build out the capacity and readiness of community organizations. We also were in close communication and work closely with the Harlem Emergency Network, which is a community-based organization founded uh, that's focused on promoting emergency preparations and emergency communications in Harlem, Upper Manhattan, and the Bronx. The Harlem Emergency Network has a really robust communication network. They do radio, social media, they do walkie-talkies, they basically do everything plus cell phones. And again, they formed after Hurricane Sandy. So there was another, there's a common trend here in Northern Manhattan because they felt that parts of Harlem that were ne not necessarily considered flood vulnerable were hit really hard by Sandy and were not prepared for it. And so both of these organizations do emergency planning in general. And we really wanted to talk to them about flooding. And another part of our plan is extreme heat. But for the purposes of tonight, I'm talking specifically about flooding. And Harlem Emergency Network had a lot of background um, conversations with community members about the flood, the flood preparedness. They had noticed that there were really some acute challenges when informing the community about their flood risk. One was that the flood zone since Hurricane Sandy had changed dramatically in northern Manhattan, and we know that they're updating constantly, and it's, they're never actually completely accurate because of how quickly things are changing. But it included parts of northern Manhattan that were never really considered flood vulnerable, and they were not convinced that a lot of people were aware that they were now living in a flood zone. Um, they also had concerns about moving flood shelters, which is a data set that's going to be hard to find. And Oftentimes, it's only activated in an emergency situation, which at that point may be difficult to locate. And they also noted, which I think is really interesting and important for and unique to specific communities, but that a high number of our residents in northern Manhattan don't have reliable access to Internet or are not comfortable navigating the Internet. And so a lot of this data is no not accessible to them at all, especially during COVID when so much is resorted to online and there's very little print being handed out. So with that. We work, we are in the, the planning stages, so I don't have as much like visuals to show you because I think we will be well at the end of the spring slash summer. But we're working with Urban Systems Labs to really understand how do we help communicate these really vital data sets that are visual and maybe visually appealing to some and maybe difficult to understand to others, but are really important to preparedness and safety. And how do we make them really easy to navigate and simple? How do we simplify this? And I think that's like the big theme that we've heard from our community when we talk to them is that this can be overwhelming if you are not somebody who works on data every day or even looks at a computer frequently. But it's really critical information. And so we've been working, we're going to work with Urban Systems Labs on both a digital map that we can layer this data and also a print version because the print is going to be critical for reaching really vulnerable populations that might not have access to, to computers. We also went through a really robust community engagement process with WEACT members, with Harlem Emergency Network members, and with East Harlem Co-Ed members, as well as just the general public, community boards, et cetera and walks through different scenarios of flooding, whether it's a flash flood from a thunderstorm or a hurricane situation like Sandy, to get a sense of what other data or data people are looking for or are act 
or want to would want in an emergency situation. And we came up with some really interesting data sets that do exist on open data, open data, and are not necessarily always mapped when we look at like NYSEM's maps. And that included Link NYC locations, the flood risks of subways and bus routes, which I didn't include there, ADA accessible subways, publicly owned facilities for emergencies, and population density. So. We're really trying to make sure that these the maps that we're going to create for our community that we're going to use as not only an outreach tool, but really a preparedness tool. As this is your unique and specific risk in northern Manhattan. We want to make sure it has the information that people are looking for in a way that is relatable to them in their situation. And so we're really excited to you know get to work on this project. And I think some just like key takeaways from the community-led planning process, bleh, excuse me, <laughs> planning process that I would like to leave um, you all with and before the discussion is that communities want to organize themselves. The number one feedback we got from our public meetings, a public meeting about how to best prepare yourself for an emergency, like a climate-related emergency, the number one response was like, know your neighbors, talk to your neighbors, make sure somebody knows you, make sure everybody, you have your neighbor's phone numbers. And so there is this desire to organize ourselves and data is really important and it can help bolster that, but only if it's accessible to the people who need it most. How data communicated is key. I think that there's a lot of different, there's visual learners, there's auditory learners. That really is matters when you're trying to communicate really important and specific information and also helps somebody relate to it or not relate to it. And also that research sharing and building out community networks are critical pieces of informal data that improve a community's resilience. And this was something else that really clearly came out of conversations we had with Hen, Harlem Emergency Network and the community at large was this desire to have a Northern Manhattan network that highlights what organizations exist in the area and what resources they could provide in an emergency. And so we've been working with our community groups in Northern Manhattan to put together that informal map and have businesses and organizations sign up and share what resources they have and they could provide in an emergency scenario. And so we're hoping to that to make that kind of a piece of this plan that will live either online or in some way in print so that people, they have these informal networks that they can combine with the data that exists to create this like perfect cohesion of understanding of vulnerability and risk. So I'm going to leave it at that because I also want to leave some time for discussion. So thank you very much for having me and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Annie. Sweet. We have one final presenter who is Madalena Romano. How are you, Madalena? Great. My yes. presentation will be short, I promise. That's wonderful. Are you able to share a screen? I'm going to try sharing the screen from my phone right now. Let's see what happens. Okay, perfect. Go for it. All right. You can see your phone, yes. Awesome. That's exactly what I wanted. Hi, everyone. So my presentation isn't actually a slide deck. It is a story map that I've been drafting. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Madalena Romano, and I'm the Director of Asset Management at DOT. And I began at DOT working with resiliency. So I was a consultant hired after Sandy to do a lot of the data management. And since then, I've moved on to asset management, but I have a soft spot for resiliency matters and particularly for emergency management. I'm a doctoral student and I'm getting my PhD in emergency management as well, but I tend to favor computer science and data engineering. So that's what a lot of my research is on. And my areas that I'm currently really interested in right now are LoRaWAN, and machine learning, as well as augmented reality mapping. So I decided to test out some augmented reality mapping and see how that would work on the flood net sensors, as well as some of the other data that's available out there on open data. And just, I'm, not, I'm just gonna go through some of this now. The first thing I did, because I love making maps as I converted the entire website to a story map. This stuff you've already seen, but it's just hosted differently. And here's why. So this is the methodology of the flood net for, for why they did what they did with what they did. But I'm going to go one step further and I'm going to include my stuff in there. So here is a map that I made 
of not only the current 28 sensors, but then I overlaid that with a lot of, and this is getting a little bit blurry. Yeah, I'm doing the best I can on the phone, but hey, there it goes. So you're not only seeing the 2008 sea level rise and flooding, as well as the nuisance flooding and future high tides, but you're also seeing the locations of some of these sensors. Now, cool part is when you just click on the sensors, you can actually get a lot of information about those sensors. And for some reason, it's not showing up the way I'd like it to, but that's because at this particular, there we go. So you get a lot of information about those sensors as well. And a lot more information about my contribution and what I've been working on. So basically I've been trying to experiment with an Esri Labs application, also hosted on GitHub, that's called AUGEO. So for augment, basically allows you to use augmented reality in your mapping. I thought, what a great idea for FloodNet, especially for the sensors, because you want to be able to see not only, hey, this is where the sensor is, but you want to be able to see what your area might look like if it was flooded. And it's that type of immersive learning that can really get a community to understand exactly what kind of risk they currently face. And that's how you get people to start opening up and asking questions. So I experimented a bit and there's a tutorial I created on this site. The site is in draft mode, so it's not really ready for prime time yet. But for this example, I created a test sensor and I made this video outside of my job because my job is um, located at sea level. So I'm very certain that we will flood. In fact, during Sandy, there was quite a good deal of flooding in the building. So I created a sensor and you can see that, hey, it's saying that there's a sensor there. There isn't, it's a fake one. But basically here I am walking further and further into it. And I thought it was great because, hey, you can use this and can see your relative position. You can walk towards and see what type of environment you currently have there. But there are some drawbacks because this particular app only allows you to use points. That's not great for flooding and flooding events, especially if you want to have a look at how far inland some of that flooding may be and what is at risk. So unfortunately, can't do polygons, but I have, since I've I have a lot of interns that work for me. So I asked them, hey guys, see if you can't fix this, try to create some sort of augmented reality application that can work with this. Use Unity, see what might happen. I think Urban Labs is also working with Unity on this. But in any case, I'm super interested in being able to map them, being able to see all of this information in augmented reality to make it a sort of interactive, useful tool for those that don't understand the science behind it, but that could understand the immersion or the gamification of the information. I'm also currently heavily involved in other research projects with NYU and CUSP, and I don't necessarily think I should talk about them unless Charlie's not here, is he? Andrea's here, but it's not Andrea's project. Yeah, Charlie's not here at the moment. Okay. so. other research project trying to use machine learning algorithms on some of the data captured from DOT traffic cameras on flooding. So that's actually pretty cool because if they're successful, then there's a way to actually see and possibly verify and possibly predict what's coming from their cameras. So that's very exciting. Unfortunately, I don't have um, anything more than that. So I'm going to... How do I stop sharing my screen? Oh, there it goes, stop share. Okay, so that is my presentation. Thank you all very much for having me. And for any of those that may not, if I may not have made it clear, I want to partner and like help and volunteer with all of you guys at Urban Labs and We Act and everything else like that. So if you need my skill set, happily volunteer. Wonderful, a round of applause to all the presenters for your amazing work. I think that just to open it up, as Madalena closed it, is there ways that each of you think that people can become involved? How, if anybody here is, is has heard you and watched you and next thing, next thing they want to do is get involved and help. There are always room for people that are 
curious and interested, but I think some of the best top places, and this is hard to advertise, there are contacts for every single one of these fantastic groups. Email at info, volunteer your time, talk about your skill sets, tell them what you want to do. And one thing that might actually be helpful is that some of these sites should advertise for what kinds of skills they're looking for and what kind of people they want to volunteer. Because yeah, there's uh, no end of creative solutions that people can come up with if they work together, but you need that teamwork and you need to be able to talk to others that aren't computer scientists, that aren't data engineers, to really find out what the user experience needs to be. Otherwise, designing the user interface is pointless because if you don't know if they understand it or if they're trying to understand it, then that doesn't help. So yeah, I, I would say let's find what, if anyone's interested in volunteering, please reach out and contact. For the ones that have websites, please talk more about what kind of volunteers you're looking for and let's engage because we need that. Thank you. Madalena, is anybody else from the panel willing to give their perspective? We, when we have more of our portal back up, or up we're going to also be alerting people. So if you want more information, you can go to the Flood Net website. I do want to point out, as Madalena said, when designing portals, data visualization, printable reports, et cetera, we always reach out to community members and to ask, does it work? Does it make sense? Is it meaningful? What can be changed? And we've been working, as I mentioned, with different stakeholder groups, and we see those as being researchers, see agencies and community members, and we try to keep them somewhat separate so we can get that different, those different needs from different groups. But yeah, if you fill out that contact us box. And what we can do is let you all know when we need more people to provide feedback. It's always super, super helpful. Wonderful. Yeah. And I would actually just also love to jump in on this because I totally agree. And I think that representation really matters and making sure that the people you're getting feedback from are coming from a diversity of populations and backgrounds and experiences, especially. And at We Act, we have a subcommittee of really committed members who are helping us put together this climate ready uptown plan. But a lot of them have experience in emergency planning and that's why they're drawn to this project. And so we're also making sure that we create a, you know, a focus group with a paid stipend to get different perspectives from different community boards, from public housing, from, you know, non um, English speakers to make sure that we are really engaging everybody and making sure that everybody does have access to these tools. It's wonderful. It's not an easy thing to do, for sure. As you mentioned, typically those that raise their hand first to come are the ones who have that inclination and they end up being that, that first person who comes. And that's things we always strive towards, but challenging to pull off sometimes. Thanks also for the suggestions on, on, on ways to do it. We have a raised hand from Deepay Wu, PhD. Yeah, hi. My name is Dee, and I am an environmental scientist with the Office of the Attorney General in the Environmental Protection Bureau. Tish James, they just put out a press release that we were talking to the National Weather Service about those wireless emergency alerts being put out in languages in addition to English and Spanish. And I was just curious how much you all, you know, collectively have thought about language access, especially given that most of the people who died in Ida spoke Chinese or Nepali or other languages, again, that are not English or Spanish. Thank you for that question and comment. Exactly. It's really important. I, I should note that a bunch of what I presented is kind of in a beta phase and it's some development, but we've definitely been in discussion about how we need all of our materials in multiple languages. And I think especially, as I mentioned, we have this flood report, our flood alert system, which also is in a beta stage and we're, we're building it up to be more, more robust. But absolutely, multiple languages is important. And we've, we're waiting on a little bit of funding to be able to hire on more community engagement people. Hopefully it's just around the corner, but one of the priorities for them is also translation and, and working with native language speakers of different languages to make sure that we have everything right. I think, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It's super important. Yes, definitely. I do have a question I want to raise that is linked to some of my thoughts around WEACT's CRUP, the Climate Ready Upton Plan. And it's, what are the, like, how do you, do you have any thoughts about 
the trade-offs that we will have to navigate when we are in an attempt to make things more understandable, we might blur some of the data that we have. Sometimes people just want to know, okay, yeah, there's all these layers, there's all these data, but can I drive to a hospital or not? Will I be able to, to take a bus? And that, I think that's this is just taking off now, but we're definitely going to face this question is, do we turn... You, do we turn flooding in a yes, no binary, knowing that this is going to be a very large map that we are imagining, you are envisioning that people will have it uh, mag with magnets on their fridge, or do we need to go in a different down a different path to be able to explain and translate the complexities of uncertainty, probability, you know, what it means, the difference between four inches and one foot of flooding. How there's so much in between that is not being shown right now. The difference between pluvial and coastal. So all of those things, we're just starting, but it's definitely a question that we're going to be dealing with. Yeah, I, I would just echo that. I think it's still a question and I'd be doing a disservice to the community by giving my opinion. And I think that it's challenging because people who don't work with data frequently or map it, including myself, oh, let's throw seven data sets on a map and it's going to be really easy and to read and not the case. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to have, especially the focus group, give us their real take on how to interpret the maps that we show them in different formats, as Pablo was explaining. And some, one thing that we're really, I'm really excited about is we are trying to make these interactive. So the print map would be a foldable out map of Northern Manhattan. And we're, we want to try and include like stickers or just directions for people to really mark their home mark their work, mark their closest subway, mark their closest hospital and map out those routes to understand where they might encounter flooding. Because that's another area of there's a real lack of information that we found in our research is what to do if it starts flooding and you're out, you're on the subway, you're you're walking home from work. And so there's a, still like a lot of questions, but I think it's it's exciting to get the opportunity to work with urban systems labs and see how people react to different data because right now the city maps are excellent, but they are hard for the average New Yorker to pick up and look at and say, I understand my risk and I understand what's going on. If there, if you guys don't have more to say about that, we do have a question in the chat that says, this is more of a general question. I think Katie mentioned reporting fatigue, but have any of you experienced planning or community engagement fatigue in your work or within the community? And if so, what kind of changes slash improvements you would like to see to alleviate that? That's a question from teams. I'm not sure if somebody else um, has a, a thought on this. I think that especially when you are doing, I know that we've had this run into this with our project is that everybody has a very strong opinion. Um, of how they expect the project to pan out or want the the map to look like. And it is a really delicate, it's a really delicate thread that you're needle that you're threading to make sure that you are not, you are not like dis disengaging different people and or over relying on certain opinions, but really taking what the feedback that you're getting and synthesizing it and finding like commonalities and finding ways to making sure you're like checking for accuracy and, and just like feasibility. So yeah, I would say it happens, but I'm also an organizer and I'm with the community all the time. So I think I have a higher tolerance, but yeah. I'll just add that I also definitely noticed that in my work around Jamaica Bay. And especially because I run Floodwatch and Floodwatch is just about collecting the data and sharing knowledge. It's not about implementing flood mitigation, or restoration projects, anything like that. So there is some frustration of when are we going to get to the action part? And I don't really have an answer to that. It's just, I think maybe my answer is just coming up with these kinds of visualization products that maybe help get us one more step closer to that action. And that can be motivating for for people to stay involved. The person who asked the question, so maybe I could give a little bit more context. I think as Katie, you mentioned, you preferring the data and then getting them to like people who would use them. And I guess me, I'm a urban designer, architect coming from an angle, which is like really taking the data and coming up with uh, plans and design to like really get to the action part. So I guess more, it's, I guess I'm not really looking for an answer, but really trying to open up and like a discussion that we could have to connect like people who is like actually collecting the data and making all these great studies and then people who are actually using that data and then trying to come up with actions with them. And also like 
to talk to community. And so I wonder if there's a better way of maybe it's like forming a community around like people like us who resides in different parts of the life cycle of these kind of data. We have this nice and great data. How do we leverage them and make a real impact? I think that's a wonderful point. We're at the beginning of having some of this flood data available. And I know that there's a discussion, at least amongst some of the academics in partnership with others, but trying to see how the data is actually used. And I think that now as the data becomes more available and we have more of it publicly available in the next couple of months, what is done with it? How is it used? And I think that's going to also help us in talking to Katie, the people who are frustrated and, and they have a right to be frustrated. They've been sounding the alarm about things they're witnessing on their street for the past X number of years. And maybe nothing's been done or something's been done, but it doesn't totally alleviate the problem or maybe there's all sorts of changes. Yeah, we have some of these discussions actually with city agencies in some ways because they have some clear desires and uses for the data. But I, we haven't had as many conversations with people in your realm, actually, some more in the, the designers and the architects as well. So I think it is a wonderful idea to bring more of us together in these discussions about what, what, what data uses could be. I had a comment and a question, but maybe I'll just make the comment and leave the question for another time. I thought that the conversations about social media and Twitter instances reporting these events and how we might link them to data and the way you were all talking about how it gives it more dimension was super interesting. And I wonder how these social media posts also might trigger some of the things that you're all working on, like maybe activate certain sensors or get attention into certain areas and things like that. So I just, it was just a comment that I just feel like there's such an opportunity. And for us on Staten Island, Ida was a really big occurrence. And of course, so was Sandy, but Ida was all over social media. So Pablo, if you need some posters that were reporting about mostly basement floodings, but the, some of the streets here, it's quite a spectacle on Staten Island when we flood because it's yeah. mostly residential. But yeah, I just thought that conversation was super interesting. I'll save my question for another time. Thank you so much, uh, Roxanne. I just want to comment on that, though, right back, because Roxanne, natural language processing is a great tool for grabbing that type of information from social media. And yeah, it actually, now you've got me curious about whether or not natural language processing from social media tweets might actually be able to be linked to any sensors or any other dashboards, ooh, or, Im or, image, proce or image processing, or image processing, exactly, mm -hmm. and uh, image processing, like using neural nets to and machine learning algorithms to um, do that. Now you've got me thinking, and ooh, I've got now I've got ideas that I'm going to bring back to others, and maybe I'll just make some of these interns do some of the work too. Yeah, it's something that we've also been talking about. And when we have all these data streams that we're bringing together, how can we pull on social media and in a way that's not chaotic? Like, how can we actually incorporate that into a data dashboard? And there's some research groups across the country that are doing some of the similar work that Pablo has done. And, and I think Pablo did a really nice job highlighting the challenges of locating these. There's a lot of grunt work I know you guys did. And so lots of data analysis work needs to be done to try to, to figure out where these locations actually are. But I think as a community, we're working on it, which is exciting. As you say, Andrea, it's really exciting. And it feels a lot of these things probably were not being thought of during Sunday. The technology was not there. The accessibility of coding libraries were not there. Twitter was not that popular of a social network. And yeah, there, there are many things that I'm keeping to myself tonight. We're approaching the end of the event. But... I want to thank everybody for being here, for your questions, your contributions, our insanely amazing panelists who have, you know, joined us from all places, you know, even from a car as far as I understand, Madalena. And yeah, speak about resilience. I'm going to hand it off to Chris to close, but we will be following up and I'm going to go to sleep very fulfilled tonight. So thank you everyone for, for being here. That's fun.